time again. I got a couple good ones I thought I'd respond to with you all. Um, first off, we got a question about uh, the infamous neck angle issue in mountain banjos. So Justin says uh, he's also planning on making a, a banjo like in the Foxfire book. The mountain banjos, we'll, we'll keep using that term. That seems to be appropriate. And I am wondering about neck angle. It doesn't seem like putting a slight angle on the neck where it meets the body is part of the design. Is this true and if so, how does it affect the playability of the instrument? Many thanks for all your advice and insights. All right, thank you for the question, Justin. I knew I'd have to, <clears throat> people have been asking me this off and on, and I of course wondered it myself and I had to figure it out for myself because I didn't really find a satisfactory answer uh, on the internet or from people I spoke to. Uh, other banjo makers that I asked how to achieve that, the back angle, uh, well first let's define, like for people who may not know what the hell we're talking about, when you look at your banjo and you see how the neck meets the pot, well you would think that it would just be flush, a flush 90 degree level flat plane where the neck meets the, the pot. But that's not true on a banjo that's properly set up. You can see mine is, should be, <laughs> um, that the neck it actually comes in at a slight angle to the pot. See the pot, I'm, I'm holding the pot at 90 degrees, and you'll see the neck is slightly tilted down like this. So I don't know what, you know, the, all the science behind that, but I just know um, I've been taught by Luthier too in my day that that's, what you what you need either when you're repairing a banjo or you're building one same is true of a guitar or a violin all that stuff it's called a neck angle a back angle so you want that angle it needs to be straight this way it needs to be straight this way but angled back some and that's something about optimum tension and and the pitch and volume that I think is mainly what I've noticed is banjos that lack that back angle they don't have the volume, and when you're, when you're playing and picking, uh, the strings don't respond back to you as nicely. So, especially if you're playing an old antique banjo, check it out and see if, if there's no angle and you can slap a square on this neck and check and see there should be some tilt up on the square. Um, and you can look up, there's all kinds of information on the internet. There's lots of diagrams, I'm happy to say, about banjo neck angle specifically. So look it up. But that's the basic gist of neck angle. So when I've asked other banjo makers and builders how to achieve neck angle on a mountain banjo, I, you get like no answer or they say like, oh, there's a way, you know, I'd have to show you. So I wound up figuring it out for myself. And I hope that I'm doing it right. So uh, how is neck angle achieved on this banjo on a, on a factory made? Here's an example a factory made, antique factory made banjo neck here. And here's an example. So this is not one solid piece of wood like you, you know, the casual observer would guess. This is one piece of wood and then this is what they call the dowel. This is a separate piece of wood. So there's a, there's a mortise in here and then this has a little tendon on the end of it and it goes in that mortise, sockets in there at the optimum angle that they want it and it's glued and then set in place. And uh, so that, that's how they make most, most of these older factory made banjos were made that way. That's how this one's made. Um, so here is a neck that I am currently cutting out. This is gonna be for um, a mountain banjo, classic mountain banjo. So the neck is, is gonna be one solid block of wood and 
the hoop, the pot, will be these three boards, three oak boards that, that fit one up here, one goes to here, and one goes up under here, and they're screwed and you know clamped in place and stuff. So anyhow, you guys, hopefully I'm, you guys sort of know something about banjo building if you're still watching this video. So here's an example of a neck I'm currently working on. You guys might have seen this before. I had it in the, in the vise last time. So I've got this rough peg head kind of shaped out. It probably won't look exactly like that. It's kind of looking a little wonky to me. So, but it doesn't matter because I'll, I'll, I'll reduce it down to a nice hourglass shape that you guys have seen how I like. I like the standard hourglass shaped peg head the most. Um, so hopefully you guys can see some of the pencil markings I've got. I started sawing this out where I'll chisel this away. So everything on this, you know, you're doing everything 90 degrees with the square and a bubble level and the clamp and making sure it's all eyed up. I do everything by hand, mostly, mostly everything by hand. So you get to this part here and <clears throat> you're using your tri-square, your, your squares and stuff and your rulers and a pencil or something or a, or a graver and you get to where you're going to start um, sketching in this this tenon basically is what it is this tongue that's going to be inserted between those boards well your your natural tendency is to take your tri square and just drop it along here and draw sketch this all out nice and square because you remember before if you guys know about a lot of woodwork before you do this you've got to have it all square and um, with do it with the tri square and stuff so you make it all square but on this you don't do that so what I'll do is I'll sketch it out square lightly and then I'll tilt kilter because you know I have so I do it real simple I sketch it out square first okay and then I, I'll, I'll set my points off by a degree or two I think two degrees of back angle is optimal something like that two to three degrees so I will off kilter it by just eyeballing it like a, a, a degree or two I'll offset my lines, my points, and I'll redraw these lines more boldly. And then I put, I put the neck in the clamp. I see how it's level, how it's level like this. And then I put um, a, a, a big level on it, like a bubble level. And I'll make it to where the lines, these, these cockeyed lines, are straight up and down to my eye. And then I'm clamping this in the clamp. And then I go to work on it with this, the back, the back saw. If you guys don't know how to use these, these traditional hand tools, there was a time when I didn't either, and I'm still learning. Um, if you don't have a person to learn from, like your dad, your grandpa, whatever, uh, it's all over the internet now. Look up traditional handwork tools. This tool is really important if you're going to do any kind of mortise and tenon work, any kind of actual, um, you know, real hand, hand work with wood. So you need a, a back saw, and this one's really big. I'd like to have a couple small, you know, like I always say, have some small ones, have some medium ones, maybe have a big one. This is a big one, I would say. Um, but I, it works great for cutting the, um, the, the tenon for the mountain banjo neck. So, <clears throat> I'm sorry guys, I'm stuffered up. But I hope that explains your question, Justin. If you have any, if that didn't, Justin, comment back. Let's keep talking about it. That's a complex thing. I mean, I can walk you guys through every step of the, every minute step if you want. I just don't want to bore you to death. And I'm trying to make this for as wide an audience as possible, you know. But uh, holler back at me, Justin. Let me know what you think of that response. I have one more quick question that I'll throw in. So this is from Will. And Will says he's able to get a hold of an 1890s banjo that he loves. Well, that's great, Will. Congratulations. It's a great feeling when you finally get, you finally track down that antique banjo that is actually like awesome and it works and you get it. It is an amazing feeling. These things are like a hundred years old or more, you know, really an amazing feeling. So congratulations, Will. Um, he says it has nylon strings on it um, and he is preferring the sound and feel of nylon. My other banjo is a good time that I've had for over 10 years. I grabbed a couple extra packs of nylons and my question is, if I'm wanting to convert if, <laughs> if I'm wanting to convert my good time to nylon, what are some recommendations and precautions? Uh, I already have a no-knot tailpiece, etc. Thank you. Okay. Well, my first, you know, right off the top of my head, Will, I'd say, I mean, you've got your antique banjo that's set up with nylon. Sounds great. Um, I would just keep my good time as more of a beater, a travel kind of thing. And I would leave my medium gauge or whatever steel, cheapo steel strings on that good time. That, that's what you're probably going to wind up doing in the long run. Good time, be your, be your steel string beater, 
And then the antique one will be your nylon, like your nice one that you actually like play and use for good stuff, right? Uh, but so if you don't want to do that, if you really want nylon strings on your good time, <clears throat> the what's going to happen is at, at the nut, you know, the good time has got these little narrow, probably I'm assuming has these little narrow notches um, in uh, slots, nut slots in the nut for your strings that are designed for steel strings. So you're you might you know. What I would do is I would take that nut out of there and, and make a new nut, lay it in there, and cut new, new, not new slots, uh, and get the specific width saws from a luthier supply company like Stuart, Stuart Mac or whatever, and get the specific width saws that you want to match or close to match those nylon strings. It's gonna, the nylons are wider than steel strings is what I'm trying to tell you. So they're not gonna, they may not lay in your, in your nut very well. Or your bridge. That's the other thing. So you will need um, what I wound up doing was buying unslotted bridges by the boatload and just messing with them and, and slotting them myself. But now you know I yeah for a prefer like a performance banjo like this, um, like a professional grade banjo, I would always buy a bridge. I wouldn't make my own bridge for this. I make my own bridges for my my night like my um, old timey tack head and mountain banjo and stuff. But uh, but on your good time, you're probably going to, yeah, so you would basically need a new bridge and a new nut probably. And aside from that, no problem. Just, you know, you have to tie them up a little bit more secure up here because they're more slippery at first than steel. So, you know, it's not just a matter of like wrapping them a couple times and twisting like steel. Um, with nylons, you have to actually like knot them or twist them over themselves a couple times and get lots of tension on it. Uh, yeah. But, I mean, go for it, Will, if you want. But like I said, I would just leave that good time alone and keep it with steel on there and enjoy the hell out of the nylons on your antique banjo. Uh, that's just what I, what I would, that's what I would wind up doing. Uh, but yeah, I'm glad, that's great that you got uh, that and you got into nylons, that's cool. And uh, thanks for your question, and I'm going to wrap this up. We're getting kind of long, and I'll talk to you guys later. Thanks for watching.